Morning, grade fives. Um, so last week, we looked at a very important property or characteristic of metals. And that important property was that metals conduct heat. We also then um, did that experiment. If you did it at home, if not, you just read it from the notes. And um, the experiment of different spoons in the water, the hot water. And you would have noticed that the metal spoon got hot. This is obviously because metals conduct heat, transfer heat. Um, today's special property, we're going to be looking at magnetism. And if you look on page 73, you see that magnet there. And you will notice that some magnets, uh, that magnet has attracted some of the metals, but not the other metals. And this is because all, not all the metals are magnetic. Only a few metals are magnetic. And also on this slide, you will notice that there are different types of magnets attached there. I've attached a rod magnet, horse, horseshoe magnet, a disc magnet, a ring magnet. You do get many other different types of magnets, oval magnets and flat magnets, and so it goes on. The one property that all magnets have, and if you've had the chance to play around with magnets at home and try to push them together, sometimes you'll see that they won't go together. This is because all magnets have two poles, a north pole and a south pole. And opposites attract, and the same poles will, um, re uh, will not attract to each other, so they will push away from each other. So all magnets have poles. That's something you should need to know as well. If you have a magnet at home, now is your top chance to just go around and just touch all different types of metals and experiment because we're going to look at very soon what types of metals are magnetic. If you don't have a magnet at home, it's okay. When we get back to school, we will fiddle around with a few metals. In your textbook on page 75, there is a little section there that can lead to a bit of confusion. So I'm going to put it in simple terms. Only metals are magnetic, but not all of the metals are magnetic. So some metals are not attracted to a magnet. There are only four metals that are magnetic. Now, if you've had a chance to walk around your house with a magnet, you would have noticed that you touch some metals and they don't attract to the magnet. And you would have walked around and seen that some do attract. Now, there are only four. And these four are iron, steel. And if you remember last week, we said steel is an, has an alloy of iron and carbon. And then there's nickel, and you'll remember that we've come across nickel because of the coins. A lot of coins are plated or coated in nickel. And then cobalt, which is a very rare metal that we don't often see or use. So, repeating, only those four metals are magnetic, and that is iron, steel, nickel, or cobalt. So, in that case, we can say, if that metal is magnetic, it has to be made out of one of those four metals or even coated in one of those four metals. Um, you'll probably remember me saying that it is important in grade five for us to start applying our knowledge. So even though we have all this information, we now need to start applying it. So last week we looked at the different South African coins and what, which, um, what each of them were made from. So over here we've got the 10 cent, the 20 cent, and the 50 cent. And those are made from steel. Um, and they have been plated with the 10 cents being plated with copper. That's why it's a little different to those two. And then the 20 and the 50 cents have been plated with bronze. Now we know that steel is magnetic from our previous slide. So we can already start determining and noting what these are going, what's going to happen with this in the magnet. Then you get your one rand, your two rand, your old five rand, which I don't have right now, but those are copper 
and they plated with nickel. Now we know that copper is not one of our top four magnetic um, metals, but we know that nickel is. So those two are plated with nickel. And then we've got our new five rand coin, which is a bimetal, it's a mixture of metals, and it is not plated. So we'll see what happens to that one. So I'm going to now take a magnet and let's see what happens to it. As we go past the 10 cents, you'll see the 10, 20, and 50 cents get stuck. And they get stuck quite hard. You can shake them and they actually do not fall off. This is because they're made of steel. And we know that steel has iron in it, which is very magnetic. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and take these off now. I've got to actually force them off. Let's put them back into place. Now we're going to look at the one rand. And you'll see that it gets stuck, but it's actually quite weak and flimsy. And if I actually shake it, it falls off. This is because it is only coated in nickel. Nickel is magnetic. You can see, oh, this one's very weak. And um, one rand and two rand are made of copper, which is not magnetic, but it is coated in nickel. So there is some, uh, uh, there is a metal in it that is magnetic, but you can see it's very weak. So the force, the magnetic force in the one rand and the two rand is weak. Whereas the magnetic force in the 10, 20, and 50 cents is very strong because it is steel, which contains iron, which is a very magnetic um, metal. Now the five rand, which is a mixture of metals, doesn't stick at all. There is zero magnetism in the far rat. So that's just a little fun activity to look at. And we need to remember to use our information that's been given to us. We know that iron, steel, and nickel, and cobalt are magnetic. So we can already assume that these are going to be magnetic without actually the experiment itself. The last important property of metals that we are going to look at in grade five is that metals corrode. Now, corrode is basically when a metal gets broken down. If you look at page 76, you will see that there's a heading that says metal rust or tarnish. Now, if you've left anything outside before, you will see that it might have got a bit of rust on it. We're going to look at that just now. So, except for gold, most metals don't always stay shiny and bright, especially when they're left outside. And this is when they come into contact with the air or water, they change. And this change is called corrosion. So when the metal is broken down, it's led to change. And the one important metal that we need to focus on that changes a lot is iron. Iron corrodes very easily. And when iron corrodes, we call it rust. Now, if you've ever left a metal outside and you've seen that it turns this reddish brown color and it actually is not um, smooth anymore, it becomes a bit rough, so the texture changes, that is iron that has rusted. So a fun fact there to look at is that the chemical name for rust is iron oxide, and oxide is derived from the word oxygen. So oxygen in the air that has come into contact with the metal, in this case iron, um, leads to rust. So that's the last property, metals corrode. Just to revise, the first one, metals conduct heat. The second one, metals are magnetic. Well, some metals are magnetic and then some metals corrode. On the bottom of page 76, you will see that there are four ways to prevent metals from rusting. And the first one there is to cover the metal with a plastic. Second one, paint the metal. Third, cover it with another metal that does not rust, so plated it. And the fourth one would be to cover it with oil or grease. 
Now, we're all probably familiar with oil. Some of us might not be too familiar with grease, but grease is a little thicker and has a thicker texture than oil, but it does the same thing. Okay, now on that same page, you'll see that they've actually used images to help you there. You'll see in figure three that there are wire hangers that are coated with plastic. Figure four, a metal fence that's been painted. Figure five, a watering can that has been coated with zinc, obviously to prevent it from rusting. We know that rust, um, when iron comes into contact with water or air, it rusts, and a watering can obviously holds water. So it's important for it to not rust. And then figure six, this rusty bark chain that needs some grease or oil to keep it going. Now, a typical example, a test question would be an example of a jungle gym. We'll give you an example of a jungle gym and ask you, what do you think is the best way to prevent this jungle gym from rusting? We know that jungle gyms stay outside all day with bad weather, winds, heavy rain. They have a lot of kids climbing up and down them, so they wear and tear quite easily. Now, what would be the best way to prevent this jungle gym from rusting? Many of you will say coated with plastic, but we know that that is not a practical way. Yes, it will prevent the metal from rusting, but plastic is not a practical um, object or material to cover a jungle gym in. Others might say coated with grease or oil, which is also not practical. You can imagine after you play on a jungle gym, your hands and your clothes are full of grease and oil, or you're trying to do monkey bars and the grease and the oils um, get slippery between your fingers and you fall and hurt yourself. Even though the, those two are ways in which we can prevent rust, it is not practical for that assessment. The correct answer there would be to paint the jungle gym. And you might see that many jungle gyms in your area or school have been painted in these bright colors. Yes, it might be there to make it look a little more attractive, but it is also there to actually prevent this metal jungle gym from rusting. A similar situation, if we give you a bicycle chain and we ask you what's the best way to prevent the rust, on a bicycle chain, you're most likely going to say grease and oil because that is the right way. You're not going to paint the chain. So my important um, thing, advice there for you is read the question carefully and think practically.